Hey guys, if I sound a little bit weird in this video, it's because I'm coming down with something right now. With this whole coronavirus thing that's going around, I have to say there is a confirmed case of it in the state I live in. So if I'm dead within a couple of weeks and my channel goes silent, that's why. Anyway, on with the video. Bad Boys for Life was directed by Belgian filmmakers Adil El Arbi and Bilal Fala, whose names I probably just butchered. This film serves as the belated third installment in the Bad Boys franchise, whose two previous installments released in 1995 and 2003, respectively. And the film opens with Miami PD narcotics detectives Mike Lowry and Marcus Burnett still holding up strong in their working relationship even after working for 25 years in their precinct. But as they contemplate things such as retirement, mortality, and midlife crises, they're soon forced to face a new threat strangely connected to their history in the police force. As their colleagues and close friends become targets, they vow to take down the perpetrator of such harsh violence, teaming up with the new task force known as Ammo to get the job done. So exactly a week ago, I had not seen a single Bad Boys movie. I certainly had many experiences with Michael Bay's work before, mostly bad experiences, but somehow the tripped out adventures of Mike Lowry and Marcus Burnett had never graced my eyes. I then watched the original movies to prepare for Bad Boys for Life, and I must say that I don't really hate them how I despise some of Michael Bay's other work. Don't get me wrong, the original two Bad Boys movies are severely guilty of the problems most people associate with Bay's filmography. There's unnecessarily sexualized women, too much stuff going boom, bursts of graphic violence, action scenes that stretch one's ability to suspend reality, and run times that are just far too long. I mean, why is Bad Boys 2 that long? Honestly, his movies are just excess. The originals could be blamed for being the start of what people call Bayhem, because they are literally just the amalgamation of every excessive idea the writers could come up with. Of the two originals, I personally prefer Bad Boys 2, but that's only because of how insane it is. Technically speaking, there's a lot more that's wrong with it compared to its predecessor, but I suppose its style and energy are more fun to soak in. With all this being said, after getting two movies that were quite similar in tone and quality, Bad Boys for Life didn't really seem all that promising. After all, I had noticed a couple of red flags. The biggest of these was that literally 17 years passed between the second and third Bad Boys films. Usually development cycles that long and drawn out for sequels aren't good indicators. But on top of that, Michael Bay was replaced by directors virtually unknown to anyone living outside of Belgium. Not that I really would have wanted Michael Bay to return, but hiring young filmmakers without any prior experience in Hollywood is certainly a different kind of risk. Somehow, however, Bad Boys for Life ended up being the best movie in this whole trilogy. In fact, it's the only good one. I should address that it's still far from perfect though. I honestly have no idea if I'll even revisit it later on or have the same feelings of Harbor now. Now, so interpret my comments as you like. Besides, in the end, it's still just another generic buddy cop movie. Any tropes you might expect are pretty much there, and Bad Boys for Life does very little to deviate from cliches of the genre itself. But aside from those easy things to complain about, some specific issues I had with this movie is that not every shot looks seamless, with plenty of fire effects, green screen images, and stunts having an unnatural appearance at times. Say what you will about Michael Bay's movies, but plenty of them still utilize impressive practical in-camera effects, unlike this which sometimes goes the cheaper route. Again, I know that less experienced filmmakers made this, but it's impossible to not mention. Also, I didn't really feel that every scene worked towards building the narrative or setting up a joke, sometimes dragging down the film's sense of pace. Plot armor was also very apparent in some scenes, often forcing me to suspend disbelief when things started to get really crazy. Even so, that doesn't mean that the film isn't willing to put its characters in danger. In actuality, the situation couldn't be further from the truth, and I think that this is the first piece of evidence for why this film shines brighter than its two predecessors. For the first time in this franchise that's literally as old as I am, I actually got the sense that our heroes had legitimate obstacles keeping them from their goal. Not only that, instead of facing off against the most hilariously bland villains in history, Bad Boys for Life gave us an emotionally charged reason for us to care about those who opposed Mike and Marcus. But cutting out a lot of the excess Michael Bay brought to the franchise, and exercising some real restraint instead, these filmmakers actually told a coherent story with something at stake. Huh. Maybe it really was Michael Bay who held these movies back for so long. I've heard some people compare Bad Boys for Life to franchise-altering movies like Fast Five and Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, and even though both of those movies are definitely better, it's a valid point to make. By being more down-to-earth and focused on its storytelling like those other two movies I just mentioned, this connected on some level with me even as it delivered the humor and the action I expected to get. Since the movie actually gives the viewer something to become invested in, everything else is easy to watch while still keeping one's brain switched on. Of course, Will Smith and Martin Lawrence are 
as likable of a duo as they've ever been, but the movie also allows them to be more emotionally honest than they were in the previous movies. The writers manage to find more to explore in their characters as they approach a point where their mortality and legacy are called into question, and it all adds to everything that's at stake in the story. As a whole, Bad Boys for Life is not great by any means, but it's a good change in direction. By getting fresh voices to make the creative choices, I think the result is a much more grounded, entertaining, and engaging film without having to sacrifice the franchise's identity. And if they do end up making a fourth movie, at least they've now got a good team of fun side characters to work with, which is basically this franchise's version of the Dragon Riders. Either way, here's to hoping the Bad Boys for Life is signaling a bright future for this franchise. Thank you.